Hey there, and welcome to The Pseudo Show, where business meets open source. I'm Brandon, and today I'm joined again by Bill, better known in The Pseudo Show Matrix Room and the DLN uh, rooms as CT Linux. Bill, it's good to have you on The Pseudo Show again as a guest host. Uh, how are you doing? Thank you very much for having me. I am doing excellent. Thank you. Good. Uh, it's been a busy day for me myself, and uh been playing with some new technology that I'm thinking we're going to talk about on the pseudo show later uh, this year. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer friendly cloud platform. You can get started today with a $100 free credit by going to do.co slash DLN and create your account. DigitalOcean is helping you get your apps to market faster with their app platform. Here you can build, deploy, and scale your apps quickly by using their simple, fully managed solution. The app platform starts at just $5 a month and has support for Node.js, Python, PHP, Ruby, and many, many more. Get started today by going to do.co slash dln to get your $100 free credit. This promo is good for two months and will let you play with all kinds of ready-to-play apps from the DigitalOcean Marketplace. That's do.co slash dln. And thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of The Pseudo Show. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. You can go to bitwarden.com slash dln to check out this amazing open source password manager. Bitwarden works across your devices from mobile, desktop, browser plugins, and even the command line. We're all big fans of Bitwarden. One of those reasons is trust. So how does Bitwarden prove they can be trusted? Not only is Bitwarden open source, they have their code regularly audited by security experts. If you want to make the smart move like many awesome people in the community, then check out bitwarden.com slash DLN and get started for free. If you're like me, though, you'll want to show your appreciation by signing up for the premium edition, especially when the premium edition only starts at $10 per year. That's right, $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for being a sponsor of the Pseudo Show and the entire Destination Linux network. Last episode, we continue to discuss the current state of technology in education and discuss some open source solutions that could be used in place of proprietary counterparts and also touched on where a commercial option may be the only option. And today we're going to kind of expand on that and uh, talk about, yeah, you know, it's okay to not go all in on open source solutions if you're running an IT shop in a school. And just like any other organization, you need uh, systems that solve a problem. And sometimes, I, as I kind of addressed last in the last episode, some of the open source solutions are created in Europe. Like the one of the pro, one of the solutions I found was actually developed in Spain, and it seems to solve problems in the Spanish education space, but it may or may not solve problems in the U.S. education space. So, you know, may not solve everything. So, Bill, you and I are probably going to feel guilty if we go into a place and go, oh, we didn't replace everything with the open source solutions. From your point of view here, actually working in this space, like, where do you see it not making sense or where, you know, where it's just okay to settle more or less on the proprietary solution? Well, I can tell you having worked in schools before, both as an internal IT director and as a consultant, that you have to focus on what's in front of you right now. Because if you spend your days and your hours trying to reinvent all of your systems, your storage, your authentication platforms, the web tools you choose to use, your backups, your network, you're never going to overcome the ever-growing amount of tickets and projects that you need to get done right away. So what worked for me in implementing open source was setting aside a couple of hours a week. And even if it was just to read about open source projects in education, 
or spin up a VM and try out a basic appliance. Just having that knowledge and knowing that you have choices is really half the battle right there. Because you, whoever you are that's listening to this, that's working in a school or as a consultant or a volunteer, know your school district and their technology capabilities better than anyone else and what their tolerance would be for implementing open source solutions in a variety of ways. You might work in a school district that says, that's it, we're going all in on this and we're going to fix whatever comes up along the way. You might also find you're in a school district that's a bit more conservative with their approach that says, hold on, this needs to go through several committees, get approval from some key stakeholders before we just kind of roll this out. So I think the sliding scale of where you implement open source in your school is really up to you as the user finding that nice sweet spot. One of the things I was thinking about, you mentioned that in your state, there's even some mandated software by the, by the state government or even by uh, the local school bodies, uh, whether that's the school district itself or school board level. Um, so th- sometimes it's just not even an option. Is that what, what you, you'd agree with that bill? Like, it's just not even an option if it's like at that point, it's like, it's mandated. You got to use this. I find that as school districts see their budgets decrease for technology, sometimes that the doors actually open up for options because one thing that becomes contentious is unfunded mandates, meaning you need to pay for this. We're not going to reimburse you at a higher level, and that's just too bad. What I'm finding that schools desire is interoperability with the student information system, whatever that may be. And that's whether you're doing single sign-on or whether you are pulling data from fields or tables in that student information database so that other information systems have up-to-date content. Interoperating with uh, existing systems, whether that's just the, the student management system or learning management or library systems, that just needs to work. And whether if that's integrating it with uh, an open source equivalent of, the, of those respective systems, or the proprietary just needs to work. I've talked about identity since you brought up identity. Some of the open source identity solutions for single sign-on are pretty complex. And I know there are other single sign-on solutions uh, that are proprietary that are really simple to configure. Lower barrier to entry, to go with the proprietary one, I easily see someone not going with, say, Key Cloak, but then going with, um, I can't even think of a proprietary OAuth <laughs> 2 provider. But <laughs> so let me help you out here a little bit. Then there are a few companies out there in the commercial namespace that handle single sign-on very well, and Okta is the first one that comes to mind, and it's widely used. Uh, but in the education space, there are two that come to mind. One is called Clever. And the other one is called GG4L. And basically out of the box, they can handle data synchronization and single sign-on through a simple web portal. And the idea is that it's very easy for a non-technical person to go in and click a button and say, integrate PowerSchool, integrate Destiny, integrate Snap, integrate whatever du jour and also include APIs if you choose to write something custom. Now let's wind back about 10 years. Before these were even options, the person who was working for me at the time in the school that I managed wrote his own database and his own structure for pulling information out of the student information system. So in other words, he would uh, pull down information via FTP nightly through a secured FTP channel. All of that information would be taken out of the CSV and dumped into a MySQL database 
And then that MySQL database had other connectors, whether it was ODBC or something else that then send the information back out to all of the other systems at night. And maintaining this while it was all 100% open source did come with a human cost, which was just time. And as budgets get tighter and staffing gets reduced, how do you maintain that system? If you remove that system, which we ended up having to do because of budget constraints, you've now have to go back to doing things the manual way, which is physically uploading and download class rosters and student information for every single application that you use. Now, going back to mandatory, what we have here in our state, I want to just touch on that for a second. Here in Connecticut, we have some, we have a pair of interesting state laws pertaining to student information protection and privacy. And we are one of the first states in the nation to have such laws in place. Companies have to be compliant with these laws in order to be able to basically conduct business within education. And they have to show that they're compliant with their terms and conditions regarding the information they collect. So filtering that down a little bit, any system that you implement that's collecting student information that you're even going to think about incorporating via a single sign-on still has to get filtered through that, that law in order to be used in the school. And it's funny because Google wasn't even compliant with that for a little while. And that created quite a stir because 94% of the schools here in our state use Google workspace for their day-to-day -day productivity. So again, use open source where it makes sense for you. If you find that it's creating too much work because while you're using Linux, let's say on your servers and your desktops, if you are forced to manually synchronize data and introduce that human margin of error, then maybe it makes sense to implement a proprietary solution like a Clever or a GG4L where it saves you time to invest your resources a little bit better. Yeah, that, may, that makes sense to do that. I mean, it got, kind of goes into one of, one of the points I want to make in this uh, episode as well is probably the easiest case to make for open source software is to potentially use a hosted solution. You don't need to invest in the infrastructure, just purchase the hosted solution. That's usually, again, that low barrier to entry and takes out the operational costs of the uh, solution. For example, like Canvas, like Canvas is totally hosted. Obviously, if you really, really needed to, you could host it yourself. It's, you know, Ruby on Rails, no big deal. Um, and then with uh, Moodle, of course, that's self-hosted. They And they have appliances. I believe they even have hosted solutions as well. But that that just really helps bring that barrier to entry down. So one of the things that I have discovered along the way is that I am not an educator. But I need to be able to see things through the lens of an educator to be able to empathize with potential problems they might experience when they're thinking about implementing open source. And in doing so, one of the neat things that I learned was that every school has a teacher that absolutely loves technology and exploring technology. Find that teacher and partner with them because that's going to be your gateway into trying out wonderful open source platforms like Moodle or like Canvas and ironing out the bugs and seeing those issues come up and learning from that teacher from their point of view, but also encouraging that teacher to be a learner themselves and to spread the word about what other alternatives are out there to others. Because maybe the rest of the, the teachers don't understand that there is another answer to the same problem. Or maybe you're having an issue with your current learning management system that you didn't think you could overcome, and a different learning management system may have answered that question for you. So again, the, the goal is to have conversations about the different options available to you. Yeah, and it kind of goes to like also like the uh, experience of the tool. Like one of the things that I would like to see more adoption of is more open source video conferencing solutions, uh, whether that's Jitsi or 
big blue button, but like the unless you're tossing loads of infrastructure to Jitsi or to big blue button, the user experience, which is the most important part in this uh, space, is going to be poor. At the beginning of the pandemic, my uh, uh, daughter's school decided it was a good idea to implement big blue button. I could tell where they were hosting it. They were hosting it on a on one of the cloud providers. Um, I could tell by the IP address, and I, I don't know, my, I'm like, I'm betting it's running on one giant box. Like, there's no way this is going to scale, and it didn't. Like, it, uh, they they scheduled time on on the box. I'm like, they should have just bought, you know, should have just paid for Zoom or Teams or something else, because they didn't implement it properly. So that user experience was pretty poor. So like, if you're going to do it, you need to make the investment. Like if you're going to host these solutions yourselves, you need to make the investments in the infrastructure to make sure that that the user experience is is good. The teachers don't like it, <laughs> the students don't like it, and if, if the parents don't like it, uh, you're you're going to be throwing that out uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> so the. During the COVID pandemic, when the students were working from home or learning from home, as I should say, one of the biggest complaints that we had was performance running Zoom and running Google Meet. And that made everybody think for a minute, well, why would those two platforms be problematic? And what boiled, what the issue boiled down to be was the end user's device. So you're talking about trying to run video conferencing on a low-end Chromebook, which just simply wasn't designed to have that much memory used through video conferencing at the same time as all of the other tools. And then some school districts said, well, that's not working. We're going to choose to go to Zoom and we'll pay for it. And the results were not that much better. And Zoom has its own set of issues, just as Google has its own set of issues. So I think learning how to scale out architecture properly by partnering with an IT manager or partnering with a regional IT administrator, if there is one in your area, will help foster collaboration between districts or schools within a district or a county to have a more resilient and flexible and scalable architecture when you need the ability to have students learn remotely yeah and, and like that it's not just about the video conferencing i'm talking about ever all of it like lms doesn't perform your it's not a you know if it doesn't feel as good as the you know the hosted solutions the paid you know the paid hosted solution software as a service the adoption won't happen it just it needs to be the same which kind of bring you know kind of goes like to a few points i've made in the past in previous episodes like Open source doesn't mean that it's free. <laughs> it's uh, there's an operational cost. Like yeah, the so- the procure the software is min- is basic is zero. Like in many cases with open source, the procurement cost of the software is zero. But open source solutions, yeah, they provide that flexibility that we've been discussing. But the but they can cost as much as the proprietary counterparts because of the operational costs. You got to pay the IT administrator, obviously. If it's data center, if it's a server in a data center, you got to pay for that. Got to pay for the server. If it's on a VPS, like DigitalOcean, you need to pay for that infrastructure cost. There's still a cost. Keep making sure that that cost is on par, or if not lower, preferably. Uh, that's the best way to gain adoption of it, but that's the case with any organization, not just a school. Because like, if it's if it's uh, too expensive to operate, I don't see adoption. The the good news is that services like AWS and Azure and GCP are heavily discounted for educational institutions. There was one school district in our state that was trying to figure out how they were going to handle remote access to a CAD lab where students could do 3D modeling 
And how, what does that look like when you hand the student a Chromebook and they're used to working on a Windows machine? It's very simple. AWS was providing very steep discounts to that school district to where they were able to build virtual CAD workstations and use the Chromebooks to just simply remotely connect to that through a browser. And that is not a bad option at all because it's still allowing you as this school to meet your goal of educating students using technology as a tool to get them to the next point in their education, which is one of the things that I mentioned in the first episode that we did. If schools want to go the DIY route, whether it's on-prem or through a VPS or even a hybrid approach, they just need to make sure they have the basic understanding of how a VPS works, not putting all of your eggs in one single VM with a ton of resources. You're not really building out any resiliency in that. And just understanding the nature of how that software as a service works inside that VPS provider. Just to kind of summarize, and I want to kind of like go back a little bit. If you're going to implement open source solutions, make sure they're interoperable with the existing uh, systems. Make sure if it it is going to be implemented, make sure it provides a good user experience. So invest in the infrastructure and also ensure that the, the cost of implementing an open source solution doesn't go above the proprietary solution. Go, and go with hosted where it makes sense. Like I mentioned earlier, the host, there's plenty of software as a service solutions that are 100% open source. Moodle, Canvas are the two big examples that come to mind. And drive adoption of those. And like, what's really great about those, if you're an open source advocate and developer, and you just happen to work for, for a school district, they're, because they're open source, you can go to GitHub and contribute. But that doesn't necessarily mean like you know, you're, it'll get uh, accepted, but it, uh, it you can help make the these products better. Uh, now, if you're in these school districts, you know, Google's pervasive. It's okay not to force a migration to Nextcloud. It's just probably not going to happen. Would you agree with that? <laughs> the, when I, the goal of technology in a classroom has been to get students to the browser and let the browser do the rest. That was the phrase that we used 10 years ago when these conversations started happening about, well, why would I put Wi-Fi throughout the building? What purpose is that going to serve? Well, imagine if I was able to give your student a handheld device and tell them that was going to be their end point for learning. What would you think? And some people found it fascinating and other people jumped out of the window. But the idea was to, again, get students to the browser, no matter the device. And what that does is that takes the load off of the IT administrator to say, well, it has to be a Windows device because it simply won't work otherwise. Well, maybe that's not the case. Maybe it won't push all of the buttons you're used to having it push, but maybe in other ways it simplifies things. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick on one of my smaller schools where we are discussing possibly using devices like Raspberry Pis as the desktop in the computer lab down the road at their next, at their next hardware refresh. Because why would I pay $1,000 for a Windows desktop or even $250 for a Chrome desktop when I can pay at most $75, $80 for a Raspberry Pi complete out of the box? But that interoperability with proprietary versus open source means installing proprietary Chrome. Because there are certain extensions and certain functions that do not exist in Chromium that exist in the proprietary Google Chrome browser. And so if we're able to leverage a very inexpensive device that can run the proprietary Google Chrome, 
Well, I think that's a fantastic way to implement an open source operating system, even if it's a closed source browser in a classroom that's pretty low risk and high reward. Because here's the thing, if that doesn't work and you find, well, I ordered 10 of these pies and now they're not working the way that I want as the desktop and I'm on the hook for the blame, you can simply use them for science projects. Try using them as a weather station. Try using them to teach STEM or basic programming or robotics. It's a ubiquitous device with many purposes. I, I know a lot of schools will do, will try and really, uh, I think it's also a problem with any organization that that's uh, cash constrained. Uh, so small businesses, um, et cetera, like, what, you know, in the early, you know, in the early 2000s would implement, you know, what are now called like low code solutions, uh, like whether that's FileMaker, Microsoft Access, um, like this, these are like those things that like get stuck <laughs> in a, in, in these organizations. Uh, like the, that's the kind of thing that I would immediately target. Like FileMaker and Access, like I, like I've seen Access databases that, uh, that are being used for, uh, managing payroll, even like just like can, can, let, those are the types of things that I'm like, let's the let's peel that back and like let's see if we can replace. Uh, is that I like, you know let's go solve the real business problem, get the in the nitty gritty of the. Uh, uh, yeah, because like if a, if a Microsoft Access database is running on on two thousand, you know, uh, Office two thousand three version, <laughs> you're, uh, you're not going to have a good day uh, when that eventually goes down, and you can't install Office on a modern Windows platform, or can't get Windows two thousand running, or well, <laughs> um, whatever the case may be. Uh, that that those are like the things I think of when I'm uh, uh, wanting to implement, what, like, especially when I was independent. Like those were the things that I looked for. Like ah, you got this. Let's let's replace it with this. Like uh, probably one of the new ones. We'll probably get into this deeper later uh, in a uh, this year is uh, I think it's pronounced go get, but it's pronounced J O G T, uh, which is a low code solution. Looks easy to implement. I've implemented it, uh, just to test it, but it's one of those easy things to, to go after, but it is interoperable with existing systems, like typical existing systems. Uh, you can even have it use Google authentication if you need to, that's the, how interoperable it is like just as low easy to get solution, easy to tackle problems. Uh, maybe not, maybe not sound easy to everyone else, but like to, uh, technologists it, like, ah, I, that's something we can take care of and make better that I think that those are the things that would drive open source adoption without having to get that, you know, trying to tackle it all. Uh, what, what, uh, I know that was a long-winded thing, Bill, but I just want, I want to get your thoughts on some, something like that. I think a solution like that is great because there are low-hanging fruit, such as the little Microsoft Access database hidden in a corner that you didn't know about that was actually responsible for managing all the door locks in the building, or the system that is still running on a Palm Pilot that you needed to program other industrial controls that the particular school uses. And a solution like GoGet, where it's low code, allows a technologist a low entry barrier. And going back to what I said earlier, carving out that little bit of time block in your week to explore open source technology, to read about it, to listen to an episode of the Sudo show or to play around with a low code solution like this allows you to keep your own knowledge up, but also 
help build relationships with those people that use those particular solutions in your district and show them that you're interested in the work that they do and want to help make their life easier long term. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, your feedback is welcome. Head on over to pseudo.show slash discuss. If you'd like more of the pseudo show, you can find it over at pseudo.show and on social media at, so- at pseudo show podcast. You can catch more awesome content over our network partners, destinationlinux.network. You can support the show on Patreon at pseudo.show slash Patreon or sponsors at pseudo.show slash sponsors. There'll be links in the show notes. Bill, anywhere you'd like to send our listeners? You can find me on the DLN Discord channel and Matrix Rooms as CT Linux. Come on in and say hello. Love to chat with you. You can follow me on most social media at dbrandonjohnson or my website, open-tech.net, and new content at destinationlinux.network. Thanks for listening to the Pseudo Show today, where business meets open source. Until next time. Bye.